today at this time. I think it's recording. One second. Yes, okay, so we're recording. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Rachel, are you, Rachel and Andy, are you able to see this? Yes. <laughs> okay, great. Well, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Some folks will hop on as they go. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for coming. This is a training that we're doing as a collaboration. Um, and I'm very excited to be co-hosting this with Rachel Briggs from Trustees for Alaska and Andy Motoro from Alaska Wilderness League. Uh, my name is Nicole and I'm the director of Alaska Wildlife Alliance. And together with a number of other groups, we've been working pretty hard on Kenai Rule, uh, which some of you may have heard of. And uh, the goal of this training is to get you prepared to be able to speak um, in any public forum, uh, you know, particularly with an emphasis on wildlife, public lands issues. But we're going to use the Kenai Rule as a case study because it's very topical. There are actions that are happening in the next couple of weeks. Um, but you can use the skills and format from this training in any public forum setting. So uh, please keep that in mind. So I wanted to run through a brief overview of the consequences of the um, proposed Kenai rule, what we're calling the Kenai rule. Um, so this rule, which is a suite of regulations, was proposed by the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, earlier this summer, there was a comment period that was open, um, was closed, but then reopened until November 9th. So some of you might have already commented on this suite of regulations, you can, and we encourage you to comment again. Um, don't simply copy and paste the same comment you had, but it's your opportunity to um, ask more questions and give more experience about these issues. So let's run through what exactly the Kenai rule changes would entail. So this is the Kenai refuge. Oops. <laughs> this is the Kenai Refuge. It's 2 million acres, um, 2 million of the, between 6 and 7 million acres of the Kenai Peninsula. So it's pretty substantial. Um, you'll see that the hatched areas are designated wilderness. Um, so, so it's quite a large area that we're looking to have been sharing. And this Kenai rule uh, is confusing because it sounds like one rule, but again, it's a suite of proposed regulation changes. And we'll run through all of these in more detail, but to overview, uh, the Kenai rule would propose to allow seasonal firearm discharge within a quarter mile of the upper Kenai and Russian rivers in the fall, winter, and spring. Currently, there is a buffer in this area year round. It would allow bicycles on 137 miles of trails, roads, and right-of-ways, um, as well as on designated lakes. It would allow game carts on designated roads and right-of-ways, allow ATVs, UTVs, and snow machines wherever automobiles are, are allowed on lakes for ice fishing. For the first time ever, it would permit uh, brown bear baiting, the harvest of brown bear overbait within 200 square miles of the Kenai Lowlands, and it would remove the federal trapping permit so as you can see, there's a lot of different aspects to this. Some like bicycles is strictly about recreation. Others have impacts to um, wildlife management and other forms of recreation. Um, it's important to note that as you frame your comment and orientation around this rule, you can comment in support of some aspects of the rule and in opposition to others. So this is not a one size fits all. You either have to be 100% for it or against it. You can select which areas you choose to support and what you choose to oppose. So uh, the seasonal firearm discharge within a quarter mile of the upper Kenai and Russian rivers, you can see on this map where that buffer is. This was put in place exclusively to promote public safety. Um, and the rule proposes to, sorry, um, to remove this buffer in the fall, winter and spring there's still quite a bit of rafting, boating, fishing happening during those times. So this would have implications for public safety on all other times of the year except for summer. Um, and it should be noted that that safety buffer does include the Sterling Highway, a quarter mile of the Sterling Highway, public campgrounds, trails heads, waysides, and buildings. And again, that would go away if this part of the rule 
is is passed um, in all the times of the year except for summer. Bicycles on 137 miles of trails, you can see some of them listed here. It would also allow bikes on frozen lakes such as Bot Lake, Kelly, Peterson, Marsh, Engineer, and Hidden Lake. Um, currently, there are no bicycles allowed on the refuge, so this would be um, opening access for bikers. It would allow game carts on industrial roads in the Swanson and Beaver Creek oil and gas fields up along Mystery Creek. You can see the map uh, yep, right there where some of these game carts would be used. And this is a big one. It would, again, for the first time ever, allow brown bear baiting within 200 square miles of the Kenai Lowlands, which you can see right here in this area. So the question that we ask of you all is, should this be happening on the Kenai National Wildlife Refuge? There are currently less than 500 brown bears estimated on the Kenai Peninsula. This could be less. Um, and bear baiting is a pretty efficient way to kill bears. Uh, Alaska Department of Fish and Game dropped the salvaging requirement. So um, brown bears can be shot and their meat does not have to be salvaged. It's mostly regarded as a trophy hunt. Um, and there is bear baiting in all of the adjacent state lands outside of the refuge. So this truly does currently serve as the only refuge for brown bears from this type of hunting practice. And again, this would be the first time that this would ever be allowed on the refuge for brown bears. Um, it also asks questions about whether brown bears would be conditioned to human food. The bait stations are, are comprised of human food. Um, think dog food, grease soaked donuts, things like that. Um, and that can have implications for tourism um, and just for public safety in general. Um, and there are also some unknowns, the Swan Lake fire, um, obviously devastated the region. Um, the impacts of that to wildlife are, are yet to be seen and adding pressure of brown bear baiting onto this population during a big habitat change um, is pretty uncertain. And uh, it should be noted that the refuge is congressionally mandated to manage wildlife and their natural diversity. And so the question we hope you'll ask for yourself and for others is whether brown bear baiting um, should be happening on Kenai National Wildlife Refuge. And then uh, I'll try and run through this quickly, but uh, the rule also proposes to eliminate the refuge fur bearer trapping program, which um, might seem a bit mundane, but it actually has a lot of implications. In the 80s, there was a lot of user conflict between trappers and trappers and other groups. And so to the point actually where the refuge was considering co closing trapping completely on the refuge, but people came together and said, what if we continued to have trapping on the refuge, but with mitigation measures that would protect other users and protect wildlife that could still allow the refuge to manage its lands per their statutes. So this was in a sense a compromise. Um, part of the permit has a one-time trapper orientation class Trappers must identify all of their traps and snares with the refuge so that the refuge authorities know whose traps are whose. Um, there are trap check requirements every four to seven days, depending on where you are in the refuge. Um, you cannot place traps or snares within 30 feet of any site exposed baits. I'll, I'll touch on this later of why that's important. This is a big one for dog walkers, for recreationalists, skiers, bikers, if the area is open for biking and you like to bike with your dog. Under this permit, there's no trapping within one mile of road accessible trailheads, public roads, or public recreational facilities. Um, there are restrictions to conserve lynx, beaver, American marten, and red fox. And under this permit, there's no serrated or tooth legged hold traps. Um, so let's run through what this would look like. And I do want to mention that these are, we're taking photos from the refuge. So some of these are a bit hard to see if, if you're sensitive to that, you might not want to look closely at this. So the uh, trapper orientation class, it's one time a year. Um, it's free, it's easily accessible. And uh, this really provides um, an opportunity to address public concerns over the ethics, safety, and animal suffering side of trapping for trappers. 
It also improves trapper understanding of what the refuge management objectives are. So if the trapping permit goes away, so too does this class, which is the opportunity for the refuge to uh, let trappers know what they're trying to manage for and how to reduce conflicts with users, how to reduce animal suffering, et cetera. This would also go away, the no trap or snare buffer. So you can see all of these areas in purple are currently closed to trapping and snaring. If this federal trapping permit goes away, so too do these buffers. Um, one interesting uh, little tidbit is that there have been millions of dollars spent on creating wildlife underpasses on this section of the Sterling Highway. If this rule goes away, that would mean that traps could be laid in those underpasses. So all of that money to funnel wildlife to safe crossings under the Sterling Highway could actually be population sinks for wildlife that are trapped in those um, safety areas. And of course, this has implications for dogs, dog walkers, and, and what really led to that buffer being put in place in the first place was to protect dogs. Um, Again, this would also take away the site exposed bait setback. This is really um, important for birds who are flying. If they see site exposed bait, they'll land right on it or near it. And if the trap is there, birds were getting caught by their talons all the time. Um, so this is really to protect bycatch, like mostly eagles, ravens, and other birds. And uh, something to note going forward is, again, I said there were trap check requirements four to seven days. So um, under this permit, if a bird is caught, trappers are supposed to check their traps four to seven days. There's a chance that they can save them. But if this permit goes away, not only will the setback of site exposed bait go away, but so will the, the trap check requirements. There will be no requirement to check traps within any amount of time. And before this permit was in place, there were documented cases of traps not being checked for over a month. Um, so this really touches on the animal suffering side. Um, it also touches again on bycatch. Um, this is a photo of a moose that had been accidentally snared. The trap was not checked and so the moose died. Um, so having trap check requirements is really important for improving the survival rate of bycatch species. And again, so too, if this permit was removed, would the restrictions on these four specific species that are very susceptible to overharvest by trapping. That's lynx, um, red fox. There's actually not been a documented uh, observation of a red fox in decades. We don't even know if they're there. Um, they might have been extirpated. American martin and beaver. So that's a very quick rundown of the Kenai rule. Um, there are some upcoming deadlines, which Rachel and Andy will speak to, but next week are the public hearings on this, um, on these proposed rule changes. And then by November 9th is the written comment deadline. So I did wanna open up um, just you know five minutes or so for questions, if anyone had them in the chat function. Um, if you are able to see that. I know I, I blazed through that because we want to allow time for you to practice getting your testimony together. Um, okay, Bill, is there any tracking of brown bear conflicts with local residents, meaning bears coming into residential areas to take advantage of garbage, prey on dogs, damage, uh, property damage, and has this been tied to bear baiting on state lands? Bill, that's a really good question. Um, Short, in short, I don't know, <laughs> um, but uh, that could, I suppose, be correlated to DLPs, um, maybe around residential areas after brown bear baiting was opened on state lands in 2014. Um, I don't know, but I will look into it. <laughs> um, I mean, that's that's one of the big issues, right, is, is um, getting bears conditioned to human food. Um, so yeah, that's a great question. We'll look into it. Caroline Bauer says, yes, can you explain what site exposed bait is? Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, one refuge uh, wildlife ranger said it's most commonly, um, you think of hamburger meat, kind of piled in a mound. Sometimes they'll cover it with snow, sometimes they won't. 
Um, and there, there are a lot of things you can use for bait. Um, it, it's quite a lengthy list, but um, using that example, hamburger beef kind of made into a patty stuck on the snow. If they cover it because of the albedo, sometimes the snow melts. And so birds flying over will see something kind of bloody um, and then they'll land. So it's, it's basically any legal bait um, that can be seen from the ground or from the air. And so the reason they have those setbacks of 30 feet is that if a bird does see it, which is, they're not trying to catch birds. If a bird does see it, it lands near it. It's probably not gonna land farther than 30 feet. It'll check it out and then fly away. So that's what sight exposed is. Um, Bill says, one other issue is that there's no provision to establish camera traps at bait stations, bear bait stations. This should be mandatory as if there are future conflicts with humans, the camera traps could be checked. Yes, yep. So the, the bear baiting stations would be authorized by a permit with the refuge um, and um, camera, uh, yeah, you're exactly right. The camera stations are not mentioned. And it should be um, also mentioned that all of the, um, trapping permit pieces that I went to, any issue that regards trapping, none of those were explained or analyzed in the environmental assessment that went into this rule. So um, there, and there was not an environmental impact statement done for this proposed rule, just an environmental assessment, an EA, which is less um, robust. So there are a lot of issues that were not, um, again, analyzed by the Fish and Wildlife Service before um, putting this forward. So if you see any um, other issues that you want more questions on, you want the agency to answer to, those are great things you can put in your comments. Um, because uh, as Andy will talk about, you are all subject matter experts on the refuge. You've been there, um, you've engaged with wildlife. So these are really great questions and a great observation. And okay, I'll take one more question before handing it over. Um, yes. Okay, it's not so much a question as a statement. Bear baiting will cause conflicts beyond the baiting station. Yes, that's true. Um, if you think of any other questions going uh, forward, feel free to put them in the chat and we can see where our time goes out next. Um, but I am excited to mute myself and put you in the hands of Rachel Briggs from Trustees for Alaska. Oh, and let me share my screen again. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Rachel Briggs, as Nikki just said. I'm a staff attorney with Trustees for Alaska, which is a, um, an Alaska-based law firm that focuses on issues like this. And we've been involved in this rule um, uh, on behalf of a number of organizations, including uh, the Alaska Wildlife Alliance and Alaska Wilderness League. And in the initial comment period, we submitted a set of comments based on the legality uh, of this rule and what we think are some of the legal issues with the rule. We're doing the same thing in the second comment period. Um, and I say that just to sort of highlight that there are a large spectrum of different people and organizations commenting on these things. Uh, and you don't have to be a legal expert. You don't need to be a science expert uh, in order to comment because those folks are commenting um, and you as an individual as yourself also have your own experience to add. So I'm just gonna walk you through some of the steps for how you could comment on something like this. Uh, there are three ways in the comment period. The first is electronically submitting written comments and that's what I'll spend most of the time on. Uh, is walking you through that website and how to use it. The next way is by mail. Uh, you can, you know, write, probably ideally type and print your comments and the exhibits you want to attach. Uh, and you can mail it into the address that I have up here. Uh, the only requirement is that it's postmarked by November 9th in order for the agency to consider those. So if you prefer to work on paper, feel free to write down the address. Uh, the last is orally. As Nikki previewed, there is a hearing next week that will span three days, and you can register to speak at that. I think you'll have 
two or three minutes and, and Andy will talk a little bit more. Um, but if you're interested in joining that hearing, you can uh, go to this link to register for that. So uh, Nikki, if you'd pass us through to the next slide, please. All right, so in order to comment online, uh, to submit written comments online, you need to use a website called regulations.gov. And this is the, the page that you'll be taken to if you type regulations.gov into your browser. And in order to navigate to this particular rule, the key rule, you need to know its docket number. So that's the number in the search bar that I've underlined in yellow. Um, so if you do think you might want to comment electronically on this rule, I would go ahead and write down that number right now, just so that you uh, have it handy. And that's what will get you to the rule you're trying to get to. All right, uh, if you would move us to the next slide, please, thank you. All right, so once you've typed that number in and hit search on that first page, this is the next page it'll take you to. Uh, and you can see that there are three tabs on this page. There's docket, documents, and comments. You wanna make sure you're in the dockets tab. Uh, so that's why I've circled that in yellow. And then you'll see that once you've hit dockets, there's really only one item to click, which is this rulemaking, refuge specific regulation, public use, Kenai National Wildlife Refuge. And that is what we're talking about. That's the Kenai rule. So you'll wanna click on that. Uh, and when you do, next slide, please. All right, once you've clicked, oops, back one, please, Nikki. There we go. Uh, so this is the next page it will take you to. And again, you'll have three different tabs. You'll have docket details, unified agenda, and browse documents. You'll wanna click on browse documents and uh, you'll see that the very first item up there is the current proposed rule. And because the comment period is live, there's a comment button, which I've circled in yellow. It also tells you the due date, right? Comments are due November 9th, 2020. So you need to comment on or before the 9th. But once you click that comment button there, it'll take you to a page that looks like this. Um, and as you'll see, you have the option to either type your comment directly into the browser, um, or you can attach something. If you wanna write longer comments or insert photos or anything like that, you can um, attach a document if you go one down. You will notice that the, the first field where it says comment, there's a red star next to comment, meaning you're required to put something in that field. So if you are going to attach a document, you can just say, you know, comments on behalf of Rachel Briggs are attached uh, and then go ahead and attach your comments. It'll ask you for a few more questions, which I haven't included in this screenshot, just personal details like your email address and um, whatnot so that they can log the comments. Uh, but that's, that's all that goes into it. It's a fairly simple process. Um, so I believe that's my last slide. Thank you for flipping through those for us, Nikki. Uh, do you folks have any any questions about what I've just run through about the mechanics of commenting? And I see that Nikki has included those links to the hearing registration and the federal register in uh, the chat box. So if you didn't have a chance to grab either of those from the slides, you can feel free to copy and paste them from the chat box. All right. And not seeing any questions, I will turn it over to Andy. Thank you so much. Awesome, thanks, Rachel. And uh, we can go to my slide deck now, Nikki. Uh, great to be here with everyone. And um, before I get going, I want to thank and recognize Representative Andy Josephson, who's joined this call, um, a longtime wildlife advocate who's been doing stuff for decades on this fight. Um, and thank you for your leadership on that. Um, so, just with that little brief uh, shout out. <laughs> um, one of the things about commenting on these issues is what do you say, 
right? And there's a variety of people with a variety of experiences on this uh, call. You know, we heard from Nikki and she actually taught me about site, um, site uh, bait and what that looks like and, and the implications there. She's a policy expert, right? Um, one thing I love about working with Rachel and Trustees for Alaska is they know what legal requirements exist for public processes and they can spot a problem with that and point it out for the record, right? Um, people on this call have a variety of experiences and perspectives. And the bottom line when it comes to how you get your story and, and testify, um, you're an expert in one way, shape or form. And it doesn't mean you have to be an expert like Rachel or Nicole um, to be able to make an impact in the story. So one thing I'm gonna go through today is a, a tool that was actually uh, formalized in the 2000s around the time Obama was running for office, um, developed by an individual named Marshall Gans, um, who helped kind of provide a framework for telling an effective story. It's actually one of the tools that was used by a lot of organizers in that election cycle. And it really helped people connect and share their stories in ways that help move the needle. Um, so that's, that's kind of my rough plan. Um, you know, there's, there's a time and place for everything, right? And at Alaska Wilderness League, we have offices in Anchorage and Washington, D.C. Uh, we were established over 25 years ago to help bridge the gap between Alaska and our nation's capital, where so many decisions about these things are made. Um, it, it, part of that role is helping to bring Alaskans to Washington, D.C. so they can tell their story to members of Congress and to presidential administrations uh, when those administrations will take our meetings, which it's been about four years since that's happened. But uh We'll, we'll leave that aside for right now. Um, oftentimes when you get a group of people flying in from Alaska who are getting ready to go lobby on something like the Arctic Refuge, they wanna know the facts and they wanna know the figures, right? Um, and there's no question facts and figures really matter in these debates. Um, but I'm gonna just read two examples of types of things you can deliver in an elevator speech um, to illustrate the difference and the power of both of them. Um, one uh, elevator speech for the Arctic Refuge might read, the Arctic Refuge is 19.6 million acres and protections were first established in 1960 under President Eisenhower. In 1980, Anoka expanded it and 1.6 million acres of coastal plain was set aside from oil and gas exploration except for a one-time limited seismic program. Today, the Comprehensive Conservation Plan for the Refuge has a wilderness recommendation for the coastal plain. That'd be one way to go and it's a good historical lay of the land, right? Um, here's another approach and another story one could tell about the place. Um, for one week while we were in the Arctic Refuge, we didn't see one other person. One day I was lying on the tundra enjoying the 24 hour daylight and the warm 40 degree temperatures of the summer solstice. I realized at that time, the closest people to me at that entire week were the pilots on the occasional cargo flights flying overhead traversing the North Pole, going from Asia to Europe. There's a difference between those two stories, right? Um, one puts you more into a personal perspective, the other is facts. Um, and both can be powerful, both have a place, right? And what I'd encourage everyone on this call to do is as we go through these three different frames for coming up with what story you wanna tell, think about your personal story, think about how it connects to something bigger and then make it timely. And that's really the goal of this framework of story of self, us, and now. So if you go to the next slide, um, we're going to start with everything starting with a story of self. We're all in this room for different reasons. We got here in different ways. Some of you I know have decades of scientific experience and um, probably could correct me on my short little Arctic Refuge blurb that I just uh, read out. Um, be gentle when we unmute the microphone. But the point of it was to illustrate that there is power to those sorts of stories. And if that's what led you to action, that's great and, and share it. Um, but for others of you, you might be on because you saw those photos um, that Nikki shared of wildlife in your National Wildlife Refuge. This is a place you go and play and you care about it in the future. Um, others of you might be on because you work in public policy um, and you understand how important it is to balance different constituency needs and you feel like that's not being done right here. We all have a different reason, a different personal reason for being here. And so helpful elements to help you kind of ground your story and your testimony may well be, why are you as an individual caring? And when did that start? Oftentimes when you track back your story of self, you can think through an influential moment where there was a choice and a challenge put to you where you said, wow, I'm gonna get off the sidelines and, and join this fight. Um, you know, me personally, I can think of when climate uh, really kind of popped up in my memory as a teenager. Um, and so, you know, that might be a good thing to channel to help you figure out 
um, why it is you're taking time out of your day to listen to me talk, um, but also considering doing so and talking to the agency directly um, when there are hearings next week. So that's a component of the story of self. If you go to the next slide, it's about the story of us. And um, the important part of the story of us is how do you take your grounding in your personal story and make it bigger so more people can connect with it? Try to boil out something that's more universal. Uh, the question you should be answering in your story of us is how does your story reveal shared purposes, goals, or values, right? And this might be that some of, some of us on this call are gonna speak as scientists, right? And there's a scientific community that would be aghast at what's going on here. Some people are really concerned about public process. Some people on this call are worried about their dog getting caught in a trap. And I'm gonna try to model this again. I hope people will be gentle when we unmute, but I'm gonna try to model my personal version. And that's what really gets me going about the trapping regulations. Um, so, you know, you ground yourself in your story of self and then you try to expand it and make it more universal for your audience. Um, it's helpful to think through who else shares this goal with me um, for businesses in this fight. Um, there's a lot on the line for a lot of businesses and, and um, trying to channel that can be useful. If you go to the last slide, um, the story of now, you know, the way I like to think about this is, okay, I can sit here and say, I like apple pie and lots of people like apple pie, but that's not a compelling story, right? Um, the important thing we then need to establish is how are we gonna get some freaking apple pie? Um, and that's the timeliness and that's figuring out how you address the challenge you face and the choice that is being put to the agency now and how do you solve that problem, right? Um, oftentimes conservation is accused of not being solutions oriented. Um, and I think an important part of the story of now is yes, talking about the threat, but what's the alternate path that gets us where we want to be as a country? And uh, where it gets, in this particular case, gets to refuge to be a place where we can all be proud that it's jointly managed by all of us, right? So that's the story of now. Um, it's really helpful that we do have a timely threat to the refuge. We don't have to spend much time on that. We have a regulation package that Nikki did a great job going through. Um, so that'll be useful um, in your story of now. But, you know, it's important to think about how you see solving the bad package of regulations that are there right now. We've already seen a few examples of chats, including what about cameras to identify bears at bathing sites that might go astray and then uh, cause impacts elsewhere. We need to be, be able to identify those bears. That's a good example of a solution. Although I think probably the author of that would rather not see any bear baiting going on. Um, that's an example of a solution that could be offered. Um, and I do offer uh, the credibility helps here. You know, when we fly with Alaskans to DC, um, you know, some people might want to stop all oil drilling everywhere, and that might be their goal, right? Um, it's helpful to know your audience and helpful to know what you can help get them to join you on. You know, a question I think for everyone testifying, and this is a, there's no right answer to this question, do you attack everything in that package or do you pick out a few things that you really want to point out that connects to your story of self and why you care? Um, that's a strategic question that can't be answered on this call. It's for each of us to answer. But at the end of the day, you do want your action that you are hoping to get from an agency to be credible. And, and you do want to try to view it in that lens as well. Um, if we go on to the next slide, that's going to be the cheat sheet um, that tells you kind of the questions that hopefully each of these different frames help you think through. Um, and what I'm going to go ahead and do now is model a personal story that I might, I'm actually considering sharing um, next Tuesday when I testify to the agency. Um, I crafted it knowing that the audience for this is decision makers, both in Alaska, but largely also listening in from DC. Um, and, and that's where the audience is important. You know, We think that there'll probably be Fish and Wildlife Service people from the national office listening in, trying to get a pulse on what local Alaskans think. And so that's another lens that I considered when coming up with this example story. Um, and yeah, with that, I'm just going to try to model it and then we'll open it up for any questions, thoughts, feedback, and what people think. Um, so I had the good fortune of growing up here in Alaska. I was born in the state and I plan to live here until I die. And some of my earliest memories were exploring public lands. Uh, in the eighties, my family got into dog mushing and I started racing two dogs around a three mile loop in downtown Anchorage, uh, when I was six. Um, the trails got longer, and in 2001, I had the good fortune to run the Iditarod sled dog race, an 1,100-mile race from Anchorage to Nome. And me and my 16 dogs took off from Anchorage, 
uh, left the restart in Willow, crossed one road, and we didn't hit another road till Nome, where we came into the finish line. Um, it was a ex- great way to grow up, and it was a chance to explore public lands, um, exploration, and the love of the dogs is really what took me down that path. There was one incident I did had that scared me almost like no other. And um, when I was going up and over a rainy pass in the shadows, I saw what looked like a bush, but it was moving. And it turned out it was a porcupine. Fortunately, it was five feet off the trail and my dog team didn't get injured by this animal while small, but, but it can really cause a lot of damage to a sled dog. Um, and I passed it and thought, man, that would have been an absolute disaster. Uh, because if you're a dog musher, you know um, that your dog's well-being is most important to you. Uh, flash forward today, I'm on different trails. I like backcountry skiing and occasionally I bring my dog. Um, but throughout these decades, I realize when I thought more about the porcupine incident, um, how traps along trails is something that I've b- perpetually been afraid of. The idea of taking your pet and uh, going out on a walk and then all of a sudden hearing a yelp in the woods, right? And your dog is gone and it's caught in a trap. It's a terrifying thought for anyone who loves dogs. It's a terrifying thought for Alaskans who enjoy recreation in places where they assume their kids and their pets can be safe when they go out and explore these wild places. And don't get me wrong, as an Alaskan, um, I understand that there's a bunch of different uses and needs on public lands. Uh, You don't turn dog teams loose on sidewalks in downtown Anchorage. That would be a disaster. Dog teams can harm other users. And in that same way, the, the trapping regulations that are being proposed really trouble me. Because as a dog owner and as an Alaskan who values the ability to do a variety of different things on public lands, this use cannot take place a mile within trailheads. And I think that that, you know, root of it, it's really my drive as an Alaskan who likes getting out on public lands, likes to know that I can do so safely with my pets. Um, I can only imagine a mother and children would have very similar, if not stronger, uh, urges to not face this threat out of their federal public lands. That causes me to think that the agency should reject this rule as not everything being in its right place in our national wildlife refuge. So I ask that you reject that change so that we can have balanced approaches and and the federal government can continue to provide opportunities for Alaskans across the board when they use their federal public lands. So I'll stop there. Um, That was an on the fly, uh, off the cuff attempt to try to attach personal story um, to the regulation at hand. And I tried to make it about, I mean, first of all, I made it uh, thinking about the federal decision makers listening. You talk about dog mushing, you might catch their attention. I thought I'd throw that out. All stories don't have to be as flashy as having Iditarod in it, right? But I thought I would use that card, use that background that I have to perhaps maybe sink in a little bit more with the audience. But at the same time, I didn't want to make this about me and my personal fear about my dog. I wanted to make it bigger. So I tried to make an us that was broader. And then at the end, um, the threat was pretty easy. We have the regulations, but I wanted to close stronger with what is the solution. And so I think that was probably about two minutes. Um, That was the type of thing that could be an example. Um, But this is an art. You're going to have a variety of stories that you might draw on and use. Another one I thought about using was for the past seven years, every Memorial Day weekend, I've gone out to the refuge and um, played in the Swan Lake area. That's another background that could be used. Um, David Raskin is pointing me out that I went out too long. So it's a good example and a good reason to practice your testimony before you do it. Um, But with that, I'd love any feedback or thoughts um, is this helpful? Do people see a way forward? And I'll probably just unmute everyone if anybody wants to jump in, offer their own perspective on this matter, because we really do want it to be crowdsourced. Uh, this is, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, Wayne. Uh, first, I want to correct Nicole on one thing. I'm not the founder of the Wildlife Alliance. I participated with a lot of other people in establishing it. Uh, quite some time ago, but I, I've been involved off and on. Uh, but and I have to say, I'm really, I'm really uh, uh, grateful for the job that uh, Nicole has been doing. I, I just, I'm not a, as you can tell right now, I, I'm not a uh, extemporaneous person. So when I'm doing uh, any kind of oral testimony, especially one that's as limited as I think this one is, I think what I've been reading is two minutes. I hate, yeah. I hate being cut off and I hate hearing other people being cut off and then kind of confused on their train of thought as to what they were saying that was very worthwhile and having to skip a lot of stuff. So one thing that I do 
is, especially for a brief uh, comment period, is get my testimony written down. I can, with two minutes, I cannot hit a lot of the, the parts of this rule. So I'm basically limiting just touching on bear baiting and trapping that are directly wildlife related. All the other ones are both wildlife and people related, but those are the two that are stand out the most for me and my interests there. Uh, so I, I've, and I've already done it, but I've already prepared my testimony and I'm gonna make some changes based on what you've been saying. Uh, but it, it is very limited. And like I said, I'm not extemporaneous. I intend to re uh, practice, and I recommend that for anybody, practice their testimony, as you said, Andy, because you've only got two minutes and it goes by real fast. So I've practiced mine, I've written it down, and I intend to read it. I don't want to sound a lot like I'm reading it, but I want to make sure I cover what I think is important to me in, in that period of time. Uh, so I, I'd, I'd really recommend that to people too, which is think about you want to say, don't be afraid to write it down uh, and, and read it out just to make sure you can, you can make your point while you can. Another thing, and, and this always bothered me when I I, I've only been in Alaska since 1978. Unfortunately, I was not born here. I wish I was. But uh, uh, one thing that always bothered me when I first came here and got involved in wildlife issues was, you know, the the proponents for you know aerial shooting and everything was, I'm a you know native-born Alaska. I've been here for X many years. It always bothered me uh, for people to say things like that. But I think, you know, in some of these cases, and now that I've been here a long time. I'm going to start off, and, and this kind of falls into the you know, story of, uh, of us or, or my story kind of things. I'm going to say I'm, I'm a 42-year Alaska resident, and that might give some more credibility to, to my testimony and some issues. If you're not a 42-year restaurant, uh, restaurant res, resident, uh, you know, you don't have to go into it. You're, it does, doesn't mean your opinions are any less valid, uh, but uh, and in, in many cases, in my view, they're more valid if you have not been here that long. Uh, but uh, anyway, those, those are some things that I, and, and my, my testimony is gonna kind of concentrate on the, the uh, on Anilka and not, uh, you know, the, 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 the refuge, the, the wildlife service does not have to uh, coordinate with the state regulations, which are absolutely outrageous in so many cases. So I'll cut it off there, but that, that's just some of the things that, uh, that I wanted to, to bring up. Those are great points. And I will say, um, you know, in this uh, day and age with technology, I've seen people have notes when they're testifying and they sit there and say, I am very worried about this today because, you know, I'm reading off a sheet of paper. And then I've also seen people take that sheet of paper and put it right next to their camera. <laughs> and uh -huh. then you say, hey, I'm testifying today because I'm super worried about the future of the Kenai National Wildlife Refuge. You can tell the difference if you're on the receiving end. So I would encourage people just functionally to put that piece of paper right in front of them, um, right near their camera. That can help make it so you can have your notes. Um, I, I see Andy Josephson's asking the ultimate decider. Um, <laughs> that's a big question. There's no question. This is a, 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 I'd say there's probably forces in DC driving this. Um, my guess is Alaska's congressional delegation has an interest in seeing this move through. Um, and they hold a variety of purse strings potentially for these agencies. Um, you know, I don't know if Nikki or Rachel have other thoughts, but um, I think, you know, it, is the secretary going to spend a lot of time on this issue? Maybe not. Um, but I, my guess is the true decision makers are going to be in DC and those decision makers very well will change, may change um, in January. So that's the type of thing that we at Alaska Wilderness League are going to be watching very closely. Um, and should that change be coming through, we'll see where they end up and we'll go from there. Andy, uh, this is David. Um, a couple of comments that I'd like to make. <clears throat> Can you hear me all right? Yep. Uh, <clears throat> one is that to the extent possible, many of us have been uh, on the refuge a lot. And the more you can incorporate your personal experiences on the refuge itself, the more impact that's going to have. So that's one comment. The second is the more unique information you put in your statement, the more effort they are going to have to go to to analyze the statements. And if we can flood them with huge numbers of statements that have unique 
information, that is gonna slow the whole process down. And the slower the process, the better it is for us because we hopefully will try to run out the clock. And the third thing is put your main points briefly in your oral statement, but be sure to amplify on everything, including things you didn't include when you submit written testimony. So be sure to do both. Great advice. And, you know, one thing I love about trustees is they're going to be going through everything with a fine tooth comb and working with groups like us to raise a variety of points. So there's an in-depth record. Um, but on top of that, um, if you have personal expertise and you can throw out an argument that the agency has to respond to, that's amazing. Um, and so it's really good advice. And Bill, I see you have a comment about having a very disturbing bear baiting experience outside of Haines several years ago that destroyed my trip to photograph eagles there. Even though this didn't take place in the Kenai, could it still be used in testimony or written comments? That sounds like gold to me. <laughs> you know, uh, that's a good example where, um, not to contradict David, like I think talking through any experiences you have that are refuge specific, that's really useful. But in this case, you are a person out that is a you know, trying to take photographs and as a result of bear baiting, <laughs> that was threatening to you. That's the ideal type thing, a story of self that can, that could be folded into a story in two minutes for testimony. So thanks for offering that up. I think that'd be awesome. And just to follow up on that, Andy, um, responding to Bill, one of the things that is so uh, remarkable about this rule is that brown bear baiting has never been allowed on the Kenai Refuge. So, you know, I, there are not stories about legal brown bear baiting on the refuge. Uh, and so the fact that you can say that in a place where brown bear baiting was taking place, you had this negative experience, you know, that is pertinent to whether or not they should allow this entirely new activity uh, in an area that has historically not had it. I think another audience that I would encourage people to think through, there's the agency and that's really uh, important, right? Um, there's also probably gonna be media covering this. And so when you think through, and this is what we do uh, professionally, it's thinking through your theory of change. It's how are we gonna get what we want and get the stories we need in front of the right people? A news story on this topic, um, think through what would the ideal headline be? And it doesn't be that you have to like incorporate the entire ideal headline that you're gonna see in the ADN in your testimony. Um, but, you know, to me, I think a robust number of Alaskans with a diversity of perspectives come out opposing bear baiting in the Kenai. <laughs> It'd be a really powerful article, especially if there was a business and a family and a pet owner perspective and recreation interests all speaking out. So um, that's another way to view crafting your testimony. How can my story help build a bigger tale in the Alaska media? that will encourage other Alaskans to join us in this fight. Um, that's something. That's a lens I'm gonna be thinking through as well. Um, it's part of the reason I went so far with the Alaska's big, there's plenty of room for these activities, just not here frame. It's maybe not where I am personally, but it's a more reasonable frame than taking on all of trapping <laughs> as an example of another way you can go. If you wanna go that way, cool, that's fine. And certainly follow your heart if it's tied to your story. Um, but that was my personal decision and what I tried to model. And one good addition, I'm really glad you touched on that, Andy, because, um, you know, the Kenai Refuge has not necessarily been elevated to the same status in the news cycle as, say, Arctic or Tongass, um, even Ambler Road, and, and those issues all deserve attention as well. Um, but speaking to Andy's theory of change comment, that there are many ways to influence this, and to Andy Josephson's question, which, again, also shout out to Andy, great job, um, that... Um, uh, how to elevate these issues and making sure that it's known that Alaskans do not want this in this particular place um, and having influence of the regulators and the managers, but also influence of the media is really important. And um, just to, uh, we'll continue to have some questions, but I did wanna um, talk about a slide about the hearings, because we've had a lot of comments and this kind of ties into that, that um, there are hearings coming up next week. Um, and let me just share my screen. Uh, and there will be media there. So um, in addition to folks in DC, to Alaska managers, um, there, will, there will also be media. So um, I'll resend the, the link to 
uh, sign up to testify in a hearing in the chat again. But um, originally it was for one day on October 26th and uh, the registration blew up. There were too many people registering. So they've now opened two additional days for testimony. Um, every person will have two minutes to testify. So again, practice because you will get cut off and, and moved along. You wanna make sure your thoughts are, are presented. Um, they will start at 4 p.m. each evening. Um, the October 26th, which is Monday hearing, has already reached capacity and they're taking 115 comments. So that means that 115 people have already registered. We do not know what those, what those 115 commenters are going to be commenting in support of. So um, it's really important if you are um, interested in this issue that you testify and that you bring people to testify. And again, if there's anything you can take away from this training, it's that you as an Alaskan, as someone who appreciates Alaska public lands, um, it, you know, your public, your personal experiences are valid and are influential in this process. So don't feel overwhelmed that, that you, um, you know, you might not have all the facts and figures, you don't need them because your, your experiences provide that. So um, the two remaining days that are available for public hearings are on October 27th and 28th, that's next Tuesday and Wednesday, and they're capping that at 75 testimonies. So um, I'll again plug this into the chat. Um, you can register for a day, say Tuesday or Wednesday, and you should receive an email confirming that you have a spot in the day that you registered. So that's option one. If there's a spot, they'll say you're set, you're going to testify on say Tuesday. If you're trying to register for Tuesday and Tuesday has already filled up, when you submit that registration, they might send you an email that says Tuesday's full, but you can here's a link to register for Wednesday. So um, that will all happen after you register. The other important thing to note is uh, if you have friends who don't want to testify, but want to listen in, everyone has to register even to listen in. So um, we'll send that out to you now. And this process has been changing um, over the past couple of days, but try to register for the day that you want, either Tuesday or Wednesday, and you'll get a confirmation if you got it, or you'll get a link to register for a different day. Um, so that is all that I have on that. Um, and we have a couple more minutes um, for questions. If I want to look in the chat and let me throw this registration link in here as well. And um, something else that I wanted to touch on is that uh, testifying can be kind of intimidating, even if you're doing it virtually. But uh, we want you to know that there are folks from all of the organizations in the coalition on this Kenai rule that will be listening, that will be testifying. So um, sometimes that helps me to know that there are people on the line who are supporting me, who um, are validating what I'm saying. So we'll be there um, to support you, even if you can't see or hear us. Okay. And Andy and Rachel, feel free to jump in with questions too. Um, I was just reviewing my notes that I ditched and I probably should have followed more through my presentation. Um, but I really wanted to emphasize with story of self, don't be afraid to brag. That's uh, like a big hurdle. I, like I didn't want to talk professionally about Iditarod ever until I did the training on this. And I'm like, oh, this is probably going to be useful. Sometimes maybe I should do it. But also don't be afraid if your story is small. It feels small because it's not small. If it's important to you, it's it's an absolute grounded reason and way you can connect with people. So if it's as simple as I went to the refuge once and on a long hike during a big tr uh, troubled time in my life, I, I made order of it, and that's important to me. That's that's equally valid and as important as if your story is flashy. So um, just really want to reiterate that that's an important part of the training I skipped over. And in terms of those stories, uh, you know, whatever the scale of them, um, I just want to reiterate as well that it's so valuable to have those concrete personal examples in the record of what this place means to you, how these changes might impact you. You know, it's as a as a law firm, we're often focused on the overarching legal theory and preserving different claims. But when we're actually talking to a decision maker, whether it's the court or 
you know, a member of Congress in DC or a member of this administration. Those are the stories that really help these people who may or may not ever have been to the refuge connect with what this place is and why it matters. So, you know, those stories, even as Andy was saying, it's just about a time you were at the refuge where it was uh, a really wonderful place to be. That's great to have available to us as we're trying to explain this issue to people near and far. And um, one thing, we'll uh, put the, the cheat sheet that Andy had. We can make these slides. Um, well, first of all, this is recorded, so we're going to put it on our website. We'll share it with Oscar Wilderness League trustees. Um, so it'll be available if you need to rewatch any parts of this. My dog just woke up from his nap. Um, and uh, we'll also be posting that cheat sheet slide that Andy uh, put together outlining the three steps. And I encourage you on all the testimony, um, you know, I just, open this sheet up and I spend two to five minutes writing, okay, what led me to this action? You know, um, what are the shared goals? It, it creates a really nice template that can be applied to any public comment period. So we'll make those resources available um, to you after this. And KB, did you have your hand up? I just noticed that a minute ago. If you're, uh, go ahead and unmute. I think you should be able to unmute and chat. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yep. <laughs> if I turn my video on, my uh, internet is so bad that, that you'll lose, I'll lose you, so I don't want to do that. Um, so I just wanted to say um, thank you guys very much for putting this on. I did say that in the chat earlier. Um, but what's unique about the Kenai National Wildlife Refuge um, versus other refuges in Alaska is that, um, here we are next to population centers. You know, that is very, very unique. I just retired from the refuge. Um, it was one of four refuges that I was the fire management officer for. Yes, I had the Swan Lake fire last year. That was a challenge um, beyond anything in my career. Um, but just think about focusing on the fact that, that wildlife can't go away from this refuge. really can't. There's 175 miles of urban interface, wildland urban interface on the Kenai National Wildlife Refuge. That's unique. We have the biggest refuges in the country here, and we have the most challenges with the Kenai National Wildlife Refuge, 75 miles of management. There's no people that have entire careers here locally um, for ordinance that are not for regulation place. So, you know, the John Moss and their poppy. <laughs> oh, um, KB, it's, is it cutting out for anyone else? It's been hard to, I'm, I'm sad that we're not getting this. Um, I, I think it's a connect connectivity issue. Would you mind putting it into the chat? Because I think what you're saying is important. Well, I'll just close with that. Um, folks that work in the refuge care deeply about this. Um, no changes. They've worked their entire years, have things as they are. So um, just that we're close to population centers and that's that will be a good um, thing to focus on we're hearing your comments. Did you hear that one? Yes, thank you. That, that's all I got. Thank you, guys. Any final thoughts or questions? Um, if not, Nikki, you want to do the honors of taking sure. us home? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, well, again, thank you so much on behalf of uh, myself, but Alaska Wildlife Alliance. We have some board members here, two members. Um, thank you so much. And so uh, we feel really lucky to be doing this work with, again, a lot of other organizations that are also represented on this call. Um, and then, you know, trustees for Alaska with Rachel has been um, just so, so helpful in this whole process. Um, Andy, the Alaska Wilderness League uh, has been helping us 
move the needle on getting people to comment and testify. And if there's anything that I can, again, impress upon you, um, that I hope you'll take away from this is that you are an expert, your voice is very important, um, and, and we really can change this, <laughs> uh, but we, we need your support. And um, so really hope that you'll sign up to testify. Um, I'll throw the link in the chat right now so you can just go straight from here to do that. Um, and if you have any questions at all, um, I think Andy threw his email in the chat. Mine is there too. Um, and yeah, some folks are asking for maps, more specific questions, all of that. We're happy to help. Um, so thank you all for spending your lunch hour with us. We really appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to stop the recording.